Matthew 15, 21 through 28 says, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and they urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, It's not right uh, for the, take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. Now one day, Jesus and his friends are traveling out of their normal stomping ground in the region of Phoenicia, where the old and hated tribes of Canaan still reside. The disciples think that Jesus is heading out for some rest, but Jesus' real intent is much bigger. Once near to the cities of Tyre and Sidon, a woman comes calling after Jesus. Now Jesus at first treats the woman as the disciples would expect a Jewish rabbi too, which is essentially like dirt. This is such a revelation of humanity to me because we continually expect God to be like us and we're, we're astounded when he isn't. So in order to reveal a bit more about his kingdom and his nature, Jesus goes along with it. He completely ignores the woman and, and when she continues to follow him, the disciples urge him not only to ignore her, but to send her away. Now here Jesus makes an interesting comment. He says, He was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, and they smugly agree. Yet what they completely fail to realize is that this is not a scathing rebuke of her, but a sad and imploring one of them. Whoa, wait, what? <laughs> uh, Jesus... Jesus is making a, a point here, a clearly defined point. If Israel had fulfilled the mission that he gave them through Abraham, which was that all the nations of the world would be blessed through his family, this, na this woman would not be an outcast. She wouldn't be a lost sheep today. She would be a fully initiated, privileged, and welcomed daughter of Israel and of God. Uh, the, the Torah and the good news of the gospel wrapped up in the coming and ministry of Jesus would not be unfamiliar to her or to anyone of that region. And there would be no heathen worship in the nearby cities of Tyre and Sidon. There would only be the worship of the one true God. But over the years, the nation of Israel had chosen to focus inward, to keep the blessings and the gospel of God to themselves. And above and beyond that, to build barriers between themselves and other nations. Now, on top of that, they considered the other nations to be gross and worthless and, and no better than dirt. And there's not a single thing relatable to our day and age in there, is there? So here are the disciples. They're cherishing their assumption that Jesus is just as disdaining of the woman as they are. And, and they're sure that the blessings of Israel are only meant for the favored children, not for the heathen dogs. And yet, to their complete shock, Jesus engages with the woman. He, he actually talks to her. In the book, The Desire of Ages, the, the author writes that, that even though Jesus was speaking in seemingly harsh terms, his face could not hide his compassion for her. In the end, what you have is this really sweet interaction. Jesus isn't calling the woman a dog or telling her that she doesn't deserve to have her daughter healed. He's speaking in terms that, that everyone present would understand. And then he shatters the current social dialogue. In response, the woman essentially says, I believe. Whatever you have to give me, I'll take it. Now, don't take this moment for granted. It has a deep significance for us today, even though it isn't really the point that we're focusing on today. But 
you can take this lesson away from the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Take this. Cling to the singular hope that God is good, even when all earthly circumstances or human treatment of you point to another conclusion. He will come through for you. So here's Jesus, healing this woman's daughter in the face of centuries of prejudice and division and hatred, right in front of his judgmental and misguided disciples. He, he not only speaks directly to that woman, to a woman, but to a member of the once hated race of the Canaanites. And instead of granting judgment and destruction on her, as would gratify them, he grants compassion and love. You see, the disciples were in the midst of this major understanding, misunderstanding of the gospel, of the ministry and, and the very nature of Jesus. And, and they cherished the views of their people, even though they'd spent day in and day out with, with love personified. And, and by now they, they could and should have known and thought differently. Now, does this narrative seem familiar? That, the idea of Israel versus the others. Um, there's the, the story of Nineveh and Jonah. Uh, how about the woman at the well? Or the demoniacs in the region of the Gerasene? Or, or how about the Good Samaritan? You know, Jesus was continually inviting the disciples to lay down their cherished sins. He was asking them to come into a new understanding, a new reality. He was walking with them through circumstance after circumstance after circumstance designed to uproot whatever was holding them back from a closer connection with him and from a better ability to love all of those around him. So as, as we've mentioned, uproot is our key word today. Now what exactly are we talking about here? You see, in this story, Jesus outlines a very very important point for us. As we accept him as our savior, as the one thing that will not fail us, this beautiful journey begins. Uh, it's a journey of becoming more and more like him. Theologians call it sanctification. Uh, and this journey, it requires the deep, deep tendrils of sin that are in, the, in that deep soil of our hearts. It requires them to be uprooted. Just like weeds, you know, with those deep tap roots in the ground, sin has rooted its way down, 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 down into the soil of our hearts. Now, Christ is then working with us and in us with our permission to clear those weeds and make sure that the ground is ready for the seeds of his character, his love, his wisdom, and his goodness so that they can grow unhindered. So we think what kind of cherished things may need to be uprooted from our lives? Well, there's a lot. There's habits. There's habits that we cherish. There's secret sins. There's treasured sins. And, and they're different because not all secret sins are treasured. There's, there's personal goals that are counterproductive to our best interests. There's prejudice. There's vices and comforts and finances. And cherished things are, are criticism and complaining and, and control. We cherish authority over others. We, we cherish how we spend our time. We cherish addictions, complacency, self-satisfaction, and considering ourselves to be better than others. Now, wait, before we get too carried away, I thought all were sinful and fall short of the glory of God. Are, are we talking salvation by works? Are we talking becoming perfect through just brute force and sheer effort? No, let's be clear. We're not talking about salvation by works or achieving perfection on our own merit. What we are talking about is giving God permission to do a work within us. What we're talking about is, is just ditching anything that we cherish more than God. Things that, that we cherish consciously or subconsciously, culturally or critically, overtly or subtly. You know, my mind goes to this little drama that the skit guys perform. Maybe you've seen it. In it, there's a man standing alone on a stage when all of a sudden somebody else comes out. And, and this new man introduces himself as God, and it turns out he's here to do some work on the first guy. 
I'm sure the guy says, yeah, whatever you want, God. And then God pulls out a hammer and a chisel. And the guy says, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on. You're, um, you're using that? God says, it's, it's the only way, my child. It's the only way. And he says, I don't know about that. I, I'm uncomfortable with a hammer and a chisel around me. Um, he, he just he doesn't like the idea of losing these, these cherished pieces. Uh, it's painful to lose that. And yet, as God works, the man begins to feel more and more free and fulfilled and happy. Why? Because underneath all of these cherished things that we cling to is God's masterpiece. It's you and I, the crown of creation. But few of us, very few, experience the joys of living as God's masterpiece because we don't want to go through that refining and chiseling out or the uprooting process. We don't want to submit. We, we don't. But the truth is, it's the only way. So back to uprooting. How does this happen? What's the process? Just like with the disciples in the story of the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus walks with us through circumstances in which we come face to face with our own specific pitfalls. At these moments, we have a choice. On one hand, we see Jesus inviting us to a better way, willing to mentor and guide and support. We see a time of discomfort as we allow him to uproot what's been holding us back from a more loving relationship with him and those around us. And yet we know that this will lead to rooting in him and eternal joy in his kingdom. But on the other hand, we see life as it's always been, comfortable, but entangled in the roots of sin. Now we can choose to turn to Jesus and accept his invitation, or we can choose to turn away. Jesus never forces us to let go of these things. And it won't be easy, but he's gracious, and he's gentle, and he's helpful. I want to say something tenderly here. Maybe you've been going through circumstances that keep bringing you face to face with something that you just don't want to let go of. You know, maybe you have this, this shopping addiction that, that you just can't beat or, or a mindset change that you just don't want to make. Maybe it's letting go of hurt that somebody inflicted on you, whether it was conscious or unconsciously. Maybe it's a political affiliation or, or a crippling fear. Remember that our loving God doesn't torture us. He doesn't align horrible events to continue assailing us. Instead, He's always there. He's always inviting us into His peace and His rest despite our trials. Uh, he's always uh, there inviting us into a better understanding and relationship with Him. He's willing, He's eager to help you uproot those weeds that are choking out his seeds of goodness. And, and though a bit of temporary pain may follow as you unalign with the ways of sin and realign with the character of Christ, it's, it'll pass. And immediate and eternal joy will be yours. And my wife and I, we've gone through this process a lot over the last few years. And, and as a couple of people that have gone through uh, some deep uprooting in the last while, let me encourage you to be open to the invitation of Jesus on your heart. Let God uproot that nasty stuff that's only hurting you now. Don't cherish it. If we love our cherished sins more than Jesus now, the end result is not just a bit of temporary and painful uprooting in this life. It's that devastating uprooting from the eternal life of joy with and in Jesus. And that's a sobering thought. But it's not one to cause us fear. Because God is so good. And he's done literally everything to be with you and to wrap you in his arms of love. And so to me, that choice is simple. It's a beautiful, beautiful journey with Jesus next to me, letting the things of this life fall away one by one and realizing that he is so much more amazing than I ever could have dreamed.